as a dramatic advisor, I had the chance to oversee this piece and I still find it very fascinating. Often both scientists and directors approach this opera as a fairy tale. While this certainly remains a very important aspect of this piece, I try to take a further step in my research. I try to set this piece and its wonderful music in its aesthetic and social political discourse at the fin de siècle, because I believe that the material the opera is based on tells us far more than a simple fairy tale morality. I came to the conclusion through Rusalka's loss of speech for more than a third of the whole opera. I would like to begin my presentation with a quick overview of the current philosophic debates about the language in fin de siècle. Then I'm going to present some musical excerpt which might be important for my approaches. To conclude my paper, I will discuss my observation in the context of the Czech German ling linguistic dispute uh, at the end of the 19th century. Culture as a whole is a discursive phenomenon and its interaction with society is a reciprocal one. Human beings, the smallest element of a society, are linked to each other through communication, which is based on the five human senses. Normally, one more than one sense is used in an interpersonal exchange to satisfy each other's expectations, needs, and curiosities. The fin de siècle marks an end of an era and the onset of another in which changes happened faster than they could be reflected and discussed. This obviously had an enormous impact on the cultural discourses. Literature became a mass product and as a result, writers had to fight for the reader's favor. In this period, the literary movement of naturalism emerged, which focuses on observation and the fictitious presentation of reality. Writers such as Emile Sola and Guy de Montpassant use a simple direct language. They emphasize the considerable social gap between the different classes of people. The newly founded magazines and journals, a further development of the fin de siècle, changed and modernized the language. Prominent philosophers at the time began to doubt the power of the word and its ability to describe the word. Current inventions and scientific discoveries led to the conclusion that formulas and equations were ra needed rather than in a philosophical and intellectual language to reflect on human beings, society, and life. This linguistic crisis was linked to the epistemological crisis in philosophy. At the fin de siècle, various philosophical concepts tended to doubt to the general validity of the term as such. Sebastian Pasch defines the word term in Neues Handbuch Philosophischer Grundbegriffe as follows, quote, Der Begriff zielt auf die Bedeutung, den Sinn, den Inhalt, den Gehalt, die Gebrauchsweise, die einschlägigen Regeln eines atomaren Ausdrucks auf das von einem Autor in der jeweiligen Sprache mit dem Redeteil ausgedrückte, gemeinte, bezeichnete, angezielte oder auf das von einem Rezipienten unter dem Ausdruck verstandene, vorgestellte, aufgefasste. In this discourse, Friedrich Nietzsche's über Wahrheit und Lüge im außermoralischen Sinne on truth and lie in a non-moral sense from 1873 remains a key work. According to Nietzsche, language emerges through visual and acoustical per perception, which leads to the semantic field that distinctly defines a single word or expression. It remains important to state that human beings master the art of lying. As a result, grammatical correctness is not necessarily congruent with the correct verbal image of reality. On the contrary, the contrast between truth and lie can be increased through language. Quote, I read it in German because it's very nice German language. Der Lügner gebraucht die gültigen Beziehungen, die Worte, um das Unwirkliche als wirklich erscheinen zu machen. Er sagt zum Beispiel, ich bin reich, während er für diesen Zustand gerade arm die richtige Bezeichnung wäre. Er missbraucht die festen Konventionen durch beliebige Vertauschungen oder gar Umkehrungen der Name. Namen. Terms and expression can therefore be, become empty nomenclatures. 
Other prominent philosophers at the time shared Nietzsche's view. Hugo von Hofmannsthal conveys similar ideas in his Ein Brief or the letter from Lord Chandis. In this work, a fictitious person called Lord Chandis writes a letter to the scientist and philosopher Francis Bacon, who lived in the 16th century. In this text, he refers to Asian myth whose implicit message remains difficult, if not impossible, to gasp, because as it is based, Bacon metaphorically puts in hidden behind a veil of fables. Saying so, he adds a further component to the linguistic crisis, the crisis of consciousness. When human beings lose their point of reference in the sense of what is right or wrong or true or false, it might be the case with the example mentioned above. The I loses its identity. The loss of identity then invariably leads to the loss of speech as words lose their meaning, their ter terminology. Mein Fall ist in Kürze dieser. Es ist mir völlig die Fähigkeit abhanden gekommen, über irgendetwas zusammenhängend zu denken oder zu sprechen. Die abstrakten Worte, deren sich doch die Zunge naturgemäß bedienen muss, um irgendwelches Urteil an den Tag zu geben, zerfiel mir im Munde wie die modrigen Pilze. Consequently, Janders invents a new language, eine Sprache, in welcher die stummen Dinge zuweilen zu mir sprechen und in welcher ich vielleicht im Grabe vor einem ungekannten Richter mich verantworten werde. This quote makes it clear that Hoffmannsthal's questions, the very basis of any philosophical approach to describe and understand the world, language itself. Somewhat paradoxically, he writes an essay about the inadequacy of language using what else? Language. Doing so, he is the first among a group of philosophers to think and write about the controversial aspects of language and communication. In this context, it remains interesting to look at Maurice Matterlang's work. In his essay collection, Le Trésor des Humbles, in English, The Treasure of the Humble, from 1896, he creates a dual system between the conscious ability of human beings to speak and the unconscious silence of their soul. In his view, language invariably remains rational and doesn't leave room for anything sensual, transcendental, aesthetic, or even emotional. Silence, therefore, remains the logical response to the inadequacy of the language, the inability to communicate, which is different from the ability or inability to speak, refers to the impossibility of the language to convey what really matters. This linguistic criticism can be understood in both, in a social and in a political context, and it many, in many cases in a personal context too, because it refers to the general difficulty of human beings to communicate what they really mean. If this cannot happen, for whatever reason, silence might be the ultimate answer the only way out. This is probably the right moment to go back to Antonin Dvorak's Rusalka. The different origins of a similar criticism of language, Hoffmannsthal being a German, Matterlank in in a, as a Belgian in France, in Paris on the other hand, show how the cultural centers in Europe were connected to each other at the time. Obviously, a wrong writer like Jaroslav Wapil, who wrote the libretto of Rusalka, knew about these discourses and was possibly part of them. <coughs> he spoke German fluently and through the Viennese drama critic Hermann Bahr, whose close friend he was, there is a direct connection to both, to Hugo von Hofmannsthal and Maurice Matterlank. Bahr was a personal acquaintance of Hugo von Hofmannsthal and introduced Matterlank to the German-speaking readers. He adapted the latter's literary concept to turn the outside to the inside and to express it in a symbolic language. It is very likely that Kvapil was familiar with Barr's publications in the 1819s before he wrote the libretto of Rusalka. Since time is limited, I picked two scenes which 
characteristically show the connection of this opera with the ongoing language crisis at the fin de siècle. Borchak changed very little in Fabil's uh, libretto. He only added one more area to the which Yeji Baba's entrance scene to establish her interaction and relationship with uh, Rusalka. From a dramaturgical point of view, this means that there remains more space for Rusalka's loss of language and her own communication crisis with the prince. Musically, this process is shown with the opera's main phrase, which is introduced for the first time in the opera's prelude. So I think you should listen to it now. Once Rusalka starts losing her ability to speak, this motif changes, it becomes shorter and diminishes. The motif's transformation starts where Kvapil extended the original version of the libretto according to Dvorak's suggestions. The clarinets and the English horn start a change of the motif, followed by first the lower string instruments and then the violins. The individual part of the motif are taken apart and put together in a new sitting, setting. Furthermore, there is a harmonic development. But we have scores here. So it goes further on. These changes have a considerable impact on the character of melody, which is elegiac and wistful at first, as it is, in the, as it is the case in Rusalka's famous song to the moon. It becomes interrupted staccato later, as if she was gasping for her voice for words. What is used to be at her disposal naturally fades and disappears. Now we just have a look at it. You can see here the melody is quite shortener and well, she's really gasping for words there. Just, I think we will leave the music excerpt. Rusalka's voice is taken away by the witch Yeji Baba as the melody of the original motif is reflected in the orchestra. Her voice, her ability to speak has shifted to the instrument mentioned above. So according to Dvorak, she might not completely lose her ability to speak, but find a new way of communication. However, it remains a hidden way to communicate, not only because she cannot use her own voice anymore and requires help from the instrument of the orchestra, but also because of the method of composition Dvorak chooses. The technique of counterpoint used in this part makes the melody glide from one instrument to another. The harmonic structure becomes stronger than the melody, which is a result is not obvious anymore. In a nutshell, her form of communication loses its humanity. There seems to be a strong connection to the philosophical theories mentioned above. Rusalka might be an impersonation of the language crisis and the general doubts in the trustworthiness of the word itself. This interpretation is strengthened by her inability to sing a love duet. 
The English horn replaces her part in the prince's second area, which appears in a passage where a love duet could be expected. Ironically, and maybe even somewhat cruelly, the lyrics of this area express the prince's skepticism about his choice of pride and being deprived of all words. Rusalka is incapable to defend, to defend herself. So let's try again. <laughs> So to conclude my presentation, I would go back to the social-political discourse of the fin de siècle. It remains important to remember that the Czech-speaking regions belong to the Austria-Hungarian Empire until the First World War. There was hardly any room for a Czech national identity, as we heard before in the other papers, until the middle of the 19th century and its development was accompanied by vast ethnic and cultural conflicts. So I brought some statistics. Interestingly, in 1900, only 7.6% of Prague's population at the time spoke German as their consorting language, because most of them are part of the local upper class, and, was them, and it was them who dominated the city's cultural life. As a result, there wasn't even a big repertoire for Czech dramas nor operas. This, however, changed in the second half of the 19th century, as we saw before. The de demand for a culture that was genuinely Czech became stronger. The local population developed a national identity and was no longer willing to accept the predominance of the German-speaking culture. This resulted in the decree of Tave Stremeyer in 1880, which, is a, which made bilingualism in offices, parties, and other public institutions compu compulsory. In my view, Dvořák's and Kvapil's Rusalka is an artistic interpretation of this aesthetic and social discourse at the fin de siècle. As a part of my PhD, which is at the very beginning, I would like to study similar processes in the French opera. I am particularly interested how language that is incapable of communicating verbally can ex express itself musically. Obviously, there remain many open questions at this stage, and I'm looking forward to finding the answers to at least a few of them in my course of my further studies. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>